All right. Earlier this week, we put out a video on the uh, dubbing brush tool for the big articulated streamers. You know, speeding time up and everything when you're tying production tying or tying multiples, whatever it may be. So naturally, this week we're going to tie a hopper. Um, this particular one. See what I did there? Had y'all build up for a big streamer, and we're tying a hopper. This particular one is about the only one that I will tie and fish these days. This is a Moorish hopper. And the reason for that is it's all foam. I can tie it really quick. Um, the biggest thing about this is the, the prep work. Uh, we're going to go with three pieces of two millimeter just regular foam. I mean, I buy this from the craft store. I think it's like 80 cents for a sheet. You could probably tie it. I don't know, 100 hoppers, probably more than 100 off of a sheet, uh, probably a couple hundred. But the reason that I tie these and fish these these days is one, um, I like to do, if I do fish hoppers, I'm very active with them. I twitch them a ton. I don't sit and dead drift a hopper. If you're dead drifting a hopper, you're passing up fish. You've got to twitch these things, animate them. Um, do whatever you can to, to get a reaction out of the fish. Two, I'll tie these big enough at times to where I have like a two inch hopper going down and I'll actually float like a mini boogeyman underneath or something like that and no issues with these things floating a boogeyman. Christ, you could, you could float a dang crescent wrench with these, I mean with, this, with six millimeters of foam It'll float a crescent wrench if you want it to, so I mean throwing a mini boogie underneath isn't bad. Now when you're actuating the fly, the boogeyman is now moving underneath, so you have two, it, it, it's just a whole new level of a hopper dropper. Um, not like you can call a two and a half inch streamer a dropper, but it is in that sense. But if you're doing just the traditional, you know, tungsten beads, whatever, I mean this, these things will float this all day long. So, to start off on this one, um, I already have these pre-glued. Um, I don't really see a need to go through the gluing process. The only thing, I mean, I use Gorilla Glue. I just throw it on there and then I take a brush, go over top of it. The only thing is to make sure that you have complete coverage on your inside. You could probably leave your outside empty with no glue because, I mean, if, if, if you go pressing on these too much, he winds up coming out and then you have glue all over your fingers and on your bench and it's just a mess. Um, normally when I do these, like I'll do in production just like everything else, I'll have a bigger sheet, um, probably, a, I don't know, a 6x6 six six at least, and I'll leave probably my outside half inch to where I don't have any glue on it. But I'll do these one at a time, so I'll glue my tan piece on the bottom and you can tie these in any color that you want to. I've seen pinks and purples and you, you name it, I mean they're out there, so um, whatever color you want to, any combination that you want, but this one we're going to go tan, green, tan. Um, but uh, like I was saying, I take the first piece, I'll glue, I'll make sure that I have 100% coverage minus my outside half inch, and then I'll press my green on top of it, and then just run my finger over it, and you'll feel it heat up one from your finger moving over top of the foam. But it'll, it'll, it'll heat up even more as that glue starts to kick. And then I'll let that set for a bit. Then I'll take my other tan piece and I'll just repeat, repeat the process over top of that. Um, I've tried the spray foams in the past. They make a freaking mess. I may not have had the right ones. I didn't like them. So I just go with the Gorilla Glue. And then on top of that... Like I said, I'll just brush it, make sure that I have good even even coverage. If you don't have good even coverage, when you go and cut these things out, um, you'll have gaps in them and they'll start to separate and it just kind of makes a mess. Um, but like I said, the biggest work on these patterns is your prep work. Everything else, it's a really quick pattern to tie. Um, extremely, extremely effective. I'm having a really tough time talking today. Um, but, on another note, once you have everything glued, these are 
Uh, I got these from MFC. These are just regular cutters. Uh, instead of, I used to trim all these by hand. Like I would just go through and spend hours trimming stuff, and then I would have a pile of pile of uh, foam cutouts here, and then I'd start the time. These make it so much quicker, and it's 100% accurate every time. So all you do with these, I'll move this out of the way. It comes in three different sizes. There's some other stuff out there as well. I like the taper that these ones have. There's very little trim work after they're out, and I'll explain that in a second. But, I mean, like I said, really simple. You can see. Here it is. And then there's a... Uh, it comes with a little rubber um, cutting block. That way you don't tear your bench up or anything. And all I do is just space these out. And then I start working this right through it. If you want to, um, you can grab like a little rubber mallet and tap on top of it and make sure it's nice and even, but I haven't found that necessary. I mean, the only, I only go really up to six millimeter on this, on my foam. But uh, that one's a little bit more on that. Just kind of work that back and forth. And then what I'll do zoom in here and I'll show you guys this. What I'll do before I peel this up is I flip it over on the opposite side and make sure that I have good complete coverage and if I don't all I'll do is just work my fingers right around here work my fingers around make sure that I don't have any any tan on this bottom. Boy this is really weird doing this looking at the monitor and <laughs> my hands want to go the opposite direction but I just work my way around this make sure that I have good coverage I don't have any pieces that aren't completely cut yet and if I do I just push my fingers through that. If you're doing a four millimeter hopper you can just pretty much stamp these and it'll come right out every time. Six millimeters about the heaviest that you'll want to do on this. If you go any heavier than that like when I do the two inch I'll basically stamp these just get the overall layout and then I'll cut it with the scissors the rest of the way. But now that we have this cut out, I gotta grab my bodkin here. I took this out the wrong way, so grab my bodkin. There's an opening on this back end on the tail end of these cutters. I made a mess out of that. We'll just pick this out. Like I was saying, there's an opening on the tail end of the cutter. If you take it out a certain way, you won't wind up doing what I'm doing right now and making a mess out of it. But that's yeah, we're in good shape. So there you can see. There's the foam portion that we're going to be working with. And like I said, with these cutters, it's it's just automatic. Every single time, it's consistent. It's the same and uh, very minimal trimming like you used to have to do with some of the old cutters. Uh, it has the nice rounded edges when you cut these out. Some of the old ones they were just a block and then you had to go through and trim. I still do that a little bit. I'll zoom in and show you what I do on these. Um, where's my foam at? There we go. So just figure out which side you want to be your bottom and all I'll do is just take my scissors. Those are serrated so I'm not going to use those and uh, I'm just going to trim at an angle and I'm just going to round these edges off. That's all I'm really doing is just rounding off the edges. So that's going to be my bottom piece and then I'm going to round off this edge right here so I'm going to have just a little bit of green sticking out the back. Not necessary whatsoever. Uh, you don't really have to do it but uh, I don't know for some reason I like to do it. carried away here. Anyhow, I'm going to stop. So now I know exactly where my center piece is going to, or where my center line is going to be. I'm going to grab this hook. This is a TMC 200R. It's a curved hook and then I'm just going to line this thing up here and I want the head, I want my eye to be free. 
I don't want to be tying over top of this and then have my mono going up underneath and it just it makes a mess. Um, I want my eye to be free so I measure this out. I'm still going to have a little bit of a tail coming out the back of the hook and with the curved hook it's going to come up a little bit more. So I'm going to find my center piece, I'm going to look over top of this and I'm just going to push down and you'll see this nice little depression. I don't know how well the camera's picking that up, especially with my fat finger in the way. You see that nice little depression in there. Now what I'll do is I'm just going to take and zoom out so you can see this process. I'm just going to take a, um, a razor, double-edged razor that I used to cut the uh, my deer head streamers with and I'm going to run right down the center. If you want to you can draw a line, that's fine. But I'm going to stop probably halfway back my tail and I'm going to run the whole way up to the front. Uh, probably going halfway down the body of this foam. So I'm actually going to go into the green a little bit. And that's for a good reason. I want this I want this fly, or I want this foam to sit down and pretty much wrap around this hook. And I could use a little bit more on that. I'm going to go a little bit further into it. Just going to make one more cut. There we go. You can always open this up and look make sure I know the camera's not going to pick that up, but it's actually going into the green here a little bit. And as I set this down, more so I'm worried about my front section. My hook, my hook eye should be coming out right below the green. Um, I'm not zoomed in near far enough to explain this. Well, there we go. You can see where my hook eye is in relation to the second foam piece and it's just right below my halfway point of the green. So I know that I'm into the green right there and when I flip this around you can see it's covering everything up. When I tie around this it's going to squeeze everything together and it's going to look like a nice seamless piece. So next up on this is I'm going to get my thread base down and I have yellow I want to go with tan so bear with me while I change my thread out oh what about it hmm? you tell me to keep it down while we're filming She's a grumpy old lady. Anyhow, I was saying we're going to swap this thread over to yellow or to tan. That's enough. Hey, hey. Not happy. We're going to swap this over and I'm going to build up a body here. And at this point, we can go ahead and zoom in. So, with this tan, I'm going to stop this just shy. You can see right where the hook point is. That's really all the more usable that I'm going to have on this. So, I'm going to stop it just shy. And I'm just going to build up a thread base here. It's going to do two things. It's going to help capture some glue and it's going to fill some space out. When I glue this, it's going to bring the body together and really kind of adhere it to the, to the hook because we're not using a ton of thread wraps on this. We're not using a ton of material. It's just glue and foam and a few, two spots really is all the more that we're going to wrap down on this. So 
what I want to do here is I have this nice thread base built up and I'm going to have my thread starting at my center point and I'm going to bring this section, I'm going to bring my foam section in here now and I'm going to let that set right like that so you can see well, I've got two dogs out there now Locks it herself up. Oh, he wants in. I'm going to start parking here soon. Anyhow, so there's, how you, there's, there's what we have right there. There's the open section. Everything's sitting right how I want it. You can see when I make this wrap, it's going to make that segment right where I want it. Um, if the segment's off or anything, before you glue this, before you do anything, move your thread left or right, whatever you need to do. And then I'm just going to bring in some zap or some cement, whatever. And I'm going to throw this right over top of my thread. That's all the more I really want. And you can see it's kind of peeling that underside in to where it's pinching this together and it's making the, a little segmentation on the body. Um, I probably should have 70 denier. I'm using uh, 140 right now. So when I flip this over at the end, it may look like there's a little, you know, it, the, the thread lines may be a little visible, but I'm not really too worried about that. As active as I move these patterns around, I don't worry about that too much. So, next up on this is I'm just going to take, um, this is a cider or an indicator, whatever verbiage you decide to use. And uh, I'm going to measure this out to where it's going to sit just shy of the head. I'm going to go ahead and cut that out and it's going to come part way back my tail. So the big thing on this is just make sure that it's thinner than the uh, than the body of your fly. There you can, well, I'm not going to really be able to show that without, yeah, it's not going to be too, ac too accurate. So I'm just going to trim this up a little bit. I'm going to cut some wedges into it. I'm not getting too crazy about this, about it being rounded out. A lot of times I don't even use these ciders. Um, I mean, you're throwing an inch and a half long hopper around. You probably shouldn't need a cider, but they do ride a little bit in the water. So if you're fishing some low light conditions, it can be helpful. But a lot of the times I'm really not even tracking the hopper. I'm tracking the eat. I see something come up and nine times out of ten, you kind of know you're into them. But if you're doing the dropper thing, then yeah, you'll want to be able to track this. So, all right. So I'm just going to make two pretty firm wraps. I'm not really wrenching down on them too much. Um, like I said, two pretty firm wraps. Other than that, um, we're going to stop it right there. We'll throw some glue on here at the end, just to kind of shore things up. But next up on this, I'm just going to take some barbed uh, grizzly rubber legs here and these are just tan and black and all I'm going to do is take these I'm going to find about my halfway point and then make one loose wrap I have both of them on my side I'm just going to peel these up and come on work your way around there we go. If you really tighten down on these thread wraps, it's going to make these legs just go all over the place. I really don't want that. I don't want them too wild. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to trim these off right like that. So now all I have is these two legs coming back and that's, that's all I'm looking for in this section. 
So now, next up, I'm going to just advance this forward, and you can see there's a natural curve. Let me see if this comes out really well or not. Uh, probably not. There is like, you can see there's like a natural curve right here. That's usually where I want my second thread wrap to go. So all I do is I lift up my indicator, I advance my thread forward, and then I make this wrap right here. Get one a little snug, two, really sink it in, and then I'm going to fold this indicator over, and I'm going to tie it well before I do that. Before I do that, don't get ahead of yourself. I'm going to put in another set of legs. And we'll trim that halfway, same thing. We're going to bring this around. Get it about to the halfway point. And then same thing, I'm just going to tie this in. Nice loose wrap. I'm going to move this set of legs to the other side, have them centered up right how I want them. This set of legs, make sure that they're centered up. And then I'm going to give one more wrap, a second, and I'm going to fold my indicator over. I'm going to catch that indicator and go one two. From here I'm just going to make a two wrap, maybe three, depending if the rubber legs want to cooperate. Whip finish. Oh. Relax there. And then we'll go ahead and trim this off. Now Oh, get up here. There we go. That whip finish is definitely not the most secure that you'll find out there. Now you can see also that we have rubber legs just laying everywhere right now. And we want to make some sort of sense out of these things. Um, for me personally, um, all I do at this point is I trim them. And I'll zoom out while I talk about this a little bit is I just trim them at this point. I don't put knots in them and have them going up this way and down at a 90. You can do that. It looks perfect on the vise. It looks phenomenal. Um, I don't because as soon as this hits the water it's going to push these legs out and like I said with as much as I twitch them I want as much motion as, as I can get out of these. So all I'm going to do is just make sure that my legs are somewhat proportional. Outside of that I want them flopping around and flailing around everywhere. As much movement as I can get as possible on these hopper patterns, I want it. I don't know about you guys, I've fallen in the water before and it's not graceful. I've got limbs and everything flailing everywhere. It's not pretty and I expect the same thing when a hopper falls in. It's going to be kicking and trying to get out of that water as quick as it can. So with that theory, I don't take that extra time and probably take me another five minutes or so per fly to get those legs with nice 90 degrees um, to get them to sit right and everything. Like I said, they look great and phenomenal on the vise. Um, I really don't see a use in it and like I said, I want my legs flipping around everywhere. So with that being said, I'll start on the front portion here. We'll go ahead and zoom back in. I'll start on this front portion and I'll just bring these out right in front of me here. and I'll give about two thumb widths. I'll let loose from that and I'll trim that one. With these ones, same thing as I do with the dungeon, I'll just kind of pull them down, find out about one and a half times the length of my front set and then on this back set I'll bring them back past my tail by probably a quarter of an inch. Make sure when you cut these, and I'll flip them this way, when you cut these don't stretch them out and cut them like that. Let them flex back and then I'll go about a quarter inch behind the tail and there you have it. 
there are your nice rubber legs they're going to be flipping around everywhere like I said as soon as this thing gets in the water these legs yeah they may be laying down right now but this thing rides level and flush with the water these things are going to push out and these legs when you twitch it it's just going to go everywhere so I don't see the point in taking the extra time and tying the nice round rubber legs or the nice knotted section and to where it has like the here I'll bring one of these out I did one of these with the knotted section to where you can see it but there's the knot section and it gives that nice like hopper leg effect to it I don't see a point in doing that and if you are going to do it what I recommend doing is tying your legs in like this and then just grab your bodkin make your wrap around it and then pull it tight and then glue the knots down that way you're able to dictate after it's already on the vise which direction your knots are going to go if you tie a knot outside of the bench and you start to tie this thing in inevitably these round rubber legs are going to want to rotate and your 90 degrees is going to wind up sticking up or sticking this way and it's just too much of a frustration for me um, I like consistency in my flies and if I have one with a leg kicking this way and one kicking that way it, it just irritates me and I really didn't find a benefit to having the knots in the leg like I said all I'm out for is motion on this so I trim the legs right as they sit uh, just how they are like this I get the motion that I want I get the leg effect and they're just flailing around like I fought, fell into the water or something like that after yeah, we'll leave that story for later on <laughs> it wasn't fishing uh, I wasn't fishing I fell into the water one time but uh, we'll leave that story for later maybe um, anyhow there is the Moorish hopper oh, before I do that before I wrap things up um, because like I said we've got a pretty loose knot for our whip finish I'll just come in here and I'll dab these up and then the same thing right around my rubber legs I'll just throw a little bit of glue right on those legs especially the ones where I cut the the front section off sometimes they have a tendency to want to pull out and slip a little bit so you may be missing a leg and fly just throw it away it's not going to catch anything but that is the Moorish hopper minus a couple modifications that I made um, on how I typically fish them but as always questions or comments and glue just kicked and got in my eye. Questions or comments, leave them with me and I'll get back to you. Thanks as always for watching and we'll catch you next week.